and I'm just checking on my phone right here in the pulpit to make sure that we are live on Facebook. Last week, for some reason, uh, Sunday School didn't stream to Facebook, so uh, we, we seem like we're in good shape. So everybody should have in front of you notes for Lesson 185. Um, so I don't have my, I don't have the tablet. I have called up here the uh, website on the TV, on the smart TV. So those of you that are joining us right now uh, online, uh, live, you can go to gracelifebiblechurch.com, scroll down to November 13th, click on Lesson 185, and you will be able to open up the notes and follow along with a PDF copy there. So... We're going to go ahead and get started, and I'm just going to teach the notes that I have in front of me, and uh, we're going to just do the best we can. Lesson 185, Richard Bancroft, Thomas Bilson, Miles Smith, and the Finishing Touches is the title for today's lesson. Again, that's Richard Bancroft, Thomas Bilson, Miles Smith, and the, to and the Finishing Touches, Lesson 185. So, introduction. Last week in Lesson 184, we concluded our study of the primary work in progress documents, by offering our final comments, I should say comments, I think, uh, on the notes of John Boyce in the general meeting. All told, we have devoted 23 lessons to a consideration of these important, understudied, and underappreciated documents. So we've spent, we have had 23 hours of, of teaching on these documents, all right? So let's just recap what we've seen then with respect to this information. In Lesson 162 and 163, we began analyzing the pre-1611 evidence for the text of the authorized version by looking at the surviving primary work-in-progress documents that have been discovered in British libraries in the middle of the 20th century. These documents included the Manuscript 98, the handwritten manuscript prepared by the Second Westminster Company that worked on the New Testament epistles. I would show you the picture of that, but of course, I don't have it with me. Bod 1602, complete 1602 Bishop's Bible containing handwritten annotations for much of the Old Testament and the Gospels. And then finally, the notes of John Boyce, the handwritten notes of John Boyce from the general meeting covering the New Testament epistles in the book of Revelation. So we've, we've studied these three things in detail, all right? In Lesson 162, I said we would consider each, uh, that would be 162 and 163, I said we would consider each of these documents in terms of the following three categories. The first of these categories was discussed in Lessons 162 and 163, and those categories were, number one, scholarly awareness and published access, number two, physical description and contents, and number three, impact on the readings found in the King James Bible. Then, in Lesson 164 and 165, we deviated a little bit from my original plan to talk about two additional work in progress doc, uh, documents, primary work in progress documents that were unknown to me prior to January of this year, 2022. These included the following. MS Ward B, Sydney Sussex College, Cambridge. This is Samuel Ward's personal draft on First Esdras and Wisdom 3 through 4 from the Apocryphal section. This is the earliest known draft work on the King James Bible. So we talked about that in lesson 164. In Lesson 165, we talked about Manuscript Bury 363 in the British Library. This contains three unpublished letters from Frenchman Isaac Casubon and King James translator John Boyce. These letters date from late 1610 or early 1611, i.e. very late in the process, utilized by the translators during the general meeting itself. If you're following along right now, we just got to the top of page 2. In Lesson 166, we resumed our study of Manuscript 98 by looking at its physical description and contents. Then in Lesson 167, 168, 169, and 170, we discussed the impact of Manuscript 98 upon King James readings by looking at Romans 1, 1 Corinthians 13, and other miscellaneous passages as well as or and the question of printer errors. Then in Lesson 171, we, we began our consideration of Bod 1602, all told, we studied, we studied the following regarding this important document. In 171, we looked at a physical description and contents. In Lessons 172, 73, and 74, we looked at its impact on Old Testament King James readings, or King James Old Testament readings. Then in 175, 176, and 177, we looked at its impact on King James New Testament readings. And then I offered some final thoughts on the impact of Bot 1602 on the King James Bible 
in Lesson 178. Then, beginning with Lesson 179, we began a six-part investigation of the notes of John Boyce and the general meaning. In, the, uh, in this mini-series, should that be hyphenated? I don't know. No? Yes? I'm not sure. Okay, in this mini-series, we consider the following. Number one, a brief history of Boyce's notes and their relation to the general meaning in Lesson 180. Lesson 181, extra-biblical references in Boyce's notes and the influence of Theodore Beza. 182, English idiom, style, and register in the notes of John Boyce. 183, we looked at observations of Gerald Hammond in the making of the, King James, or the, making of the English Bible. He had a lot of interesting things to say about Boyce's notes. And then last week, in Lesson 184, we finished... Uh, talking about Boyce's notes on the general meaning by looking at Dr. Edward Jacobs on the quantitative and qualitative work of the general meaning. So, as you can see, we've had a huge, we've covered a lot of stuff, all right? So look at the next point. Despite having spent more than 23 hours on these topics, we have only scratched the surface of what we could have looked at. So you need to understand, I'm aware of the fact that we're leaving a lot of stuff. I try to be, I try to give you samples and examples enough so you could understand and appreciate what was going on without going so far down the wormhole that I lost everybody. So I, I was trying to strike a balance there uh, on those points. So despite having spent more than 23 hours on these topics, we have only scratched the surface of what we could have looked at. My goal has been to dive deep, but not too deep. Despite leaving a lot of information on the table, I feel we have, have assembled a robust and much-needed collection of heretofore unknown information. I am not aware of any other lessons that have covered these documents at the level of depth that we have endeavored to do. So, we, I've tried to really set forth before you folks and the greater body of Christ by extension a level of depth here that I have not seen. Now, there are obviously books, scholarly essays, things that have been written about these things that I've used to teach these things, but the reality is the greater body of Christ has, has no awareness of, this, of, of, of those uh, resources. So it's been one of my goals to try to put that stuff before everybody. Okay. So the goal of the current lesson then is to begin looking at what happened to the text once the general meaning was done with its work, all right? Who saw the text through to the press in the print shop of the King's printer, Robert Barker, all right? So we've looked at this now. Of course, I'm gonna erase this side. Hope I'm not messing Blake up too much. But we've, we've seen a process now from 1604 coming all the way down now to 1611 and everything that has happened in those intermittent years, all right? We've observed multiple stages of work. We've looked at multiple documents, okay? We've looked at the work of the companies. We've looked at the work of the general meeting. So where we're at right now is like right in here somewhere right on the cusp of it being printed. That's where we're at right now with this lesson, all right? So if you go to page three, Bilson, sorry, Bancroft, Bilson, Smith, and the finishing touches. So we do know from Samuel Ward's testimony at the Synod of Dort in 1618 that Thomas Bilson and Miles Smith saw the text through to the press. Right? So down here in 1618, one of the King James translators, Samuel Ward, was at the sign out of Dort, and he was asked to comment on the, tr the process that was used to create the King James Bible. Down here, Ward recounts various points about what happened back here with the creation of the King James Bible, and he's doing that at the sign out of Dort in 1618. All right? So, here's what he says, quote, Lastly, so this is Samuel Ward's testimony. Samuel Ward was a translator, in case you forgot. Lastly, the very reverend, the Bishop of Winchester, Bilson, 
together with Dr. Smith, now Bishop of Gloucester, a distinguished man who had been deeply occupied in the whole work from the beginning, after all things had been maturely weighed and examined, notice what he says, put the finishing touches to the version. So according to Ward's testimony, who is going to put the finishing touches on this process? It's going to be two guys primarily. It's going to be Bilson and who? Oops. Bilson and who? Smith. Smith. Okay? So that's what Samuel Ward's saying here. Ward is offering this testimony in 1618 about what happened here. And he says that these two guys right here are the ones who put the finishing touches on the text. That's his testimony before the sign out of Dort. Olga S. Oakfeld, author of the King James Bible Translators, states the following regarding Bilson and Smith providing the finishing touches to the project. Quote, When in Samuel Ward's word, words, all things had been maturely weighed and examined at Stationers Hall, Miles Smith of the Second Oxford Company and Thomas Bilson, Bishop of Winchester, put the finishing touches to the new translation. So indefatigable, it's a fancy word for saying untiring, okay? So indefatigable, a worker was Miles Smith that he, uh, that he is said to have labored over at least some of his pages while riding up to London. This is a bit of a joke. More than one historian has suggested that the flood of commas in the King James Version can be traced to Smith's matching his punctuation to his riding rhythms as, a, uh, as in claret garb, a wide-brimmed hat, he jogged over the roads deep in mire. So in other words, it's bumpy, and every time he's hitting a bump, he's putting a what? A comma in, all right? There are a lot of commas in the King James Bible. So modern English teachers would probably have a fit, but whatever. We don't really, we're not really too concerned about what they would say. Bilson was high church, okay? What does that mean? That means that Bilson was an Anglican. I'm just going to abbreviate that. Bilson was a high church Anglican. All right? So Bilson was high church, and Smith had Puritan sympathies. So it's interesting. So Smith is a Puritan. Bilson is an Anglican. So it's interesting that they choose to see this thing through to the end, one Anglican and one Puritan. All right? So, Bilson was high church, Smith had Puritan sympathies, but they seem to have worked well together. Between them, they wrote a fulsome dedication to King James, as well as a long preface, the translators to the reader. So, we can kind of keep track of what they're doing. The nature of their work is, um, they're doing a few things. So, can we see this? I'm going to write it off to the side. So number one, they are, they have the dedication to the king. Now we'll look at each one of these things individually in due time. So that's the first thing they add. The second thing they add is the preface. Translators to the reader. The third thing they're going to deal with are the headings that are above the text. Uh, fuller headings to the chapters. Bilson is generally credited with the headings. He fo uh, followed the Geneva Bible more closely than the Bishop's Bible, but sometimes he struck out on his own in, uh, as in the heading for Genesis 36. So you guys can see in the notes there that the heading above Genesis 36 in the Geneva said the genealogy of Esau. The Bishop's Bible heading there was on the pedigree of Esau. And the King James heading there is the dukes that descended of Esau. Okay? Now, it, it is largely understood that Bilson is the one responsible for that. So imagine going through the whole Bible and putting a chapter heading above every chapter. That's one of the finishing touches that Bilson is believed to have provided to the final text. Okay? Thomas Bilson had been at Hampton Court when the translation was proposed. And had stood there as a principal maintainer of the Church of England. He was already recognized in Anthony Wood's phrase as being, quote, as reverend and learned a prelate as England uh, ever afforded. So in other words, is Bilson a, of high learning and a good reputation and stature at the time? 
How much polish Bilson and his fellow editors and his fellow editor Smith added will never be known. Their work may have overlapped that of the broad view, but in all probability they had a rather short time schedule. If polish was applied, it is generally believed that Smith made the improvements. Open to speculation is whether Bilson and Smith resolved some of the choices offered in Boyce's notes. The general meeting in final session at Stationers Hall may have done so. So again, there's we can we can pretty much know generally what they did. Now listen, if they're if they're writing the dedication of the king and the preface and the headings, are they dealing with the ancillary material or the actual biblical text? They'd be dealing with the ancillary material, right? The extras, the non-inspired extras, if you will, that are going to show up in the 1611. We cannot know for sure, though, if they did or did not make any last-minute adjustments to the actual text of the Bible. We don't know for sure, all right? Any questions so far? So... Ophelt also touches upon a perplexing yet unresolved question. What, if any, influence did Archbishop Richard Bancroft, the architect of the project, exert over the final product? Miles Smith, one of the final editors of the text, stated at some point, not long after publication, that Bancroft had influenced as many as 14 readings found in the 1611 text. Okay, now Bancroft, if you don't remember, he's the guy in 1604 who draws up the rules that are going to govern the project. The 14 rules that we've talked about in detail in past lessons, okay. Bancroft is the Archbishop of Canterbury. He is basically the highest ranking member of the Church of England outside of the King. King James, who would have been the head of the Church of England at this time. So, he, Bancroft is going to basic, there are many people who will say that by the time this thing gets underway and taking as long as it did, beginning in 1604 and not being published till 1611, that this is probably more accurately Bancroft's Bible than King James's Bible. People can argue back and forth about that. It is probably true that Bancroft had more to do with the day-to-day -day procedural things that are happening in the making and the creating of the King James Bible than the King did. Because I think the King, as I think I have in here in a minute, he gets involved in other affairs of state. Other things are happening. This isn't the only thing going on in England by any means at the time. And so as a result, Bancroft kind of ends up sort of being the head guy. Now, Bancroft's influence, so there's this question of 14 readings, all right? So let's look at what Oldfeld said. Quote, as it happened, Bilson and Smith as editors did not have the last word. In the end, Smith complained that Bishop Bancroft had introduced 14 more changes. No record of these changes survives. So there is an early rumor I'm going to call it that for lack of a better word. There is an early rumor, the origin of which is Miles Smith himself. Who is Miles Smith? He's one of the final two guys that puts the finishing touches on it. There's an early rumor from Miles Smith himself that the Archbishop of Canterbury, before he dies, changes or influences 14 readings. We have no list of what these 14 readings are. We don't know. We don't know for sure if it's totally true, and we don't know for sure if it is true what 14 readings there uh, he would be referring to. Now, this is a why. This is this is a you know how rumors go, right? Um, rumors. You should not just obviously the, the scriptures teach about you know not just believing rumors and tale bearers and all this sort of thing. But when you are doing historical research, if there's, if there's a, somebody saying it, you should then start looking for, is anybody else talking about this? 
And if so, what are they saying about it? Or is it just this one guy over here that's, that's, that has something to say about this? So let's move to the next point. Alistair McGrath, author of In the Beginning, The Story of the King James Bible and How It Changed a Nation, a Language, and a Culture, also commented upon the late actions of, of Bishop Bancroft. And he's got two quotes here, okay? One, the first one is from page 178, and the second one is from page 188. So he says first on 178, this is McGrath now, quote, Finally, the finishing touches would be applied to the work by the bishops of Winchester and Gloucester. So that would be Bilson and Smith. Though Bancroft appears to have drawn no attention to the fact he had reserved for himself the privilege of making revisions to what all had hitherto thought as the final draft. So here we have another historian acknowledging the fact, is there this rumor out there that Bancroft may have influenced some things at the very end, before he died, okay? Look at the next quote from page 188. Quote, having completed their recommendations for revision, the text was passed to Miles Smith and Thomas Bilson, who were charged with adding the finishing touches. It is not clear whether their role was to review the overall text of the translation or simply to comment on the specific changes proposed by the editorial committee that had met at Stationers Hall. That would be the general meeting that we've spent six weeks talking about. Then, in an apparently unscripted development, Richard Bancroft reviewed what had been hitherto regarded as the final version of the text. It would, it would be one of his final acts. Bishop Bancroft died on November 2nd, 1610. He never lived to see the translation over which he had held so much sway. Smith complained loudly to anyone who would listen that Bancroft had introduced 14 changes in the final text without consultation. Yet we remain unclear as to what those alleged changes might be have been. So here do we have another person saying that the origin that Smith was complaining loudly to anybody who would listen that Bancroft exerted some sort of final influence over the text before he died and changed 14 readings. You with me so far? Now do we know what they are? No. Can we even prove 100% that he did this? No. We cannot prove it 100% although I would be saying, and I will admit it's a bit of speculation, it would not shock me if he did. It just wouldn't shock me if Bancroft did what Smith is alleging that he did. Next point. Dr. Kenneth Fincham also comments on this unresolved mystery in his 2020 essay for the Journal of Ecclesiastical History titled, The King James Bible, Crown, Church, and People. He says, quote, Bishops Bilson and Smith were entrusted with a final review of the new translation. But there is a tradition dating from the mid-17th century, so I added 17th so you know where we're at, mid-century, that Bancroft was the last to approve it and made 14 alterations in the New Testament before it was printed. So let's do a little bit of figuring, okay? 1611 is when it's printed. And I know I got a lot of numbers here. Uh, what year did Bancroft die? 1610. November 1610. Somewhere mid 17th century. So let's just give a range. I'll say 1640 to 1660, somewhere in the mid part of the 17th century. Are there clear rumors in print that Bancroft impacted the text and the origin of the rumor is who? Smith, one of the final what? Editors. So if anybody knew if Bancroft had done this, would Smith have been in the position to know it? Yes. Did Smith complain in writing to that effect or if he did it in writing then it's not a... I would say... <clears throat> To my knowledge, undetermined. To my knowledge, undetermined. So if anybody is watching and you know the answer to that, please let me know. Yes? I 
At the time of his death, was it already at the printers, ready to be printed, or were they still overseeing the print final draft? So, good question. So with everything we know, we still do not know when this thing rolled. We don't know when in 1611 it finally was printed. There's no record. Okay? If he dies in November 1610, that's late in the year, somewhere, most people surmise in the spring, although we don't know for sure, this thing came off the press in 1611. So to answer your question, Bart, there's, it's undetermined how much was done. But I, I would say, let's say, let's say just for the sake of discussion that the first print run in 1611 was 20,000 copies, which is a fairly, uh, I, I have that number in my mind because of some stuff that I've read. We're not covering it in this lesson, but we will in the future. Let's say it was 20,000 copies. Imagine having to typeset, print, and bind a book as large as the King James Bible it's going to take some time. So it is theoretically possible that Bancroft could have intervened and uh, changed what's, uh, what, what some of the readings were on whatever it was the translators handed to the printer. Okay? Uh, did I answer your question? Uh, yeah. All right, any other questions? Let's go to top page five. Alleged textual tampering by Bancroft is discussed by many of the relevant sources commenting on the late stage of the translation process. It seems that Miles Smith's allegation of tampering on the part of Bancroft <clears throat> originated from within 10 years of the text first being printed in 1611. Okay, so if the text is printed by 1611, by 1621, the rumor is our, Smith is already talking about the fact that Bancroft what? Changed readings. Changed 14 readings. All right. So does that imply that Smith didn't know about it until after the printing? It certainly would suggest that, or he knew about it and was just and just couldn't really do anything to change what the Archbishop told him to do. Yeah. It could be either or, but we don't know. Okay. So despite these early rumors, the reality is we simply do not know what reading, should say readings, what readings, if any, Bancroft altered before he died in late 1610. That said, I do suspect, this is my own personal private subjective opinion, I do suspect that 1 Corinthians 12.28 could have been one of the passages Bancroft changed before he passed. We had discussed this in Lesson 170, okay? Open your Bible. I'll grab one from over here. <coughs> Open your Bible to 1 Corinthians 12. I'm just going to mention this here. It's going to cause the Internet to blow up and melt down, okay? But... I'm not prepared to go further right now. I, 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 when I say I'm not prepared, I mean, I don't mean, I got a whole file of stuff at home just on this, but I'm not prepared to, to go any further than what we're going to do. Look at 1 Corinthians 12, 28. 1 Corinthians 12, 28. And God has set some in the church, first apostles, secondarily prophets, thirdly teachers, now watch this next run. After that, miracles, comma, then gifts of healings, comma, helps, comma, governments, comma, diversities of tongues. Okay? Now do you see how in the Bible, in your Bible there, it says helps, comma, governments. Okay? Is that setting those aside as two distinct what? Two distinct gifts. Helps, comma, what? 
governments. In the 1611, that verse reads, helps in governments. Helps is modifying governments. They are not two what? They're not two distinct things with that reading. Okay? Now why do I say that I, this could be a spot where, where Bancroft did this? Because the 1611 reading corresponds with the Anglican understanding of how the spiritual gifts were working in relationship to church politics. The Puritans believed in the equality and the plurality of elders and deacons. The Anglicans believed in the high church authority of the bishops. The reading helps in governments is it would be a reading that would be that would be a reading that would the Anglicans would prefer and would comport with their theology of church politics. The reading helps common governments would be the way the Puritans would have seen it and then more in line with their view of church governance. So here we have this out of the blue reading that shows up in a 1611 in that spot helps in governments. And by the way, Bilson in the late 1590s himself had delivered a sermon in which he's talking about church governance and he's commenting on 1 Corinthians chapter 12 in which the reading that ends up in the 1611 is different from what was in manuscript 98 and all of a sudden it's there with really no explanation for how it got there. So I would, I would say to you this could be one of the spots where Bancroft could have exerted influence over the text. I personally think it's likely. All right. Later on, it was fixed. It was changed. It was corrected to the way it is now. The way it is in the Greek is the way you have it in your Bible there. To read it helps in governments is to insert into it a certain slant towards a view of church governance that favored the Anglicans. Bancroft was the archbishop. Was he the head Anglican? Yes. And Bilson, was he an Anglican that would have been sympathetic with Bancroft? Yes. Okay. Now, let me just bracket that and say, can I definitively 100% prove that? No. But it is a, it is a printing reality at the 1611 that that's what it had. And it also is in a spot that is directly related to the, to the disputes that were occurring between the Anglicans and the Puritans over issues related to church governance. Now, at some point in the future, I will be talking about that verse probably in a much longer window of time with all the documentation to substantiate what I think about it. Okay? Any questions before we move on to the next point? Yeah. I was just wondering how that verse reads in the Bishop's Bible since that was in It reads exactly the way it does in the King James. Okay. So, good question. The Bishop's Bible was the base text, right? I've grained that into your head now for 20 three hours, okay? Manuscript 98 was that, that revised document created by the Second Westminster Company. They did not revise it. They left it the way it was in the bishops in that document. Then all of a sudden, at the end, seemingly out of nowhere, shows up this reading, helps in governments, that literally no English Bible before that had. Okay? So, let's move on. Any other comments about that? Again, Amy, if I had my tablet, I could show you that. It is, in fact, the case. The word governments there, does it mean the same thing as it does today? Um, it is not talking about, like, political governments. It is talking about gifts, spiritual gifts in the body of Christ and the church. And it is related to until the word of God was complete, 
there were certain gifts that were given to aid the to aid the body of Christ in governing and running things. All right. Now, being a dispensationalist, I believe that these gifts have ceased and been replaced with the completed Word of God. Okay. So if you want to know what I think about that, there's other lessons on the church website that where I could direct you to. So is there like doctrines that would be like the doctrines? This 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 uh, govern uh, helps healings, helps governments, diversities of tongues. Governments would be related to people who had a gift for administration and helping to run things and set things up in the local church. That's the way I understand it. Okay. See, I knew I couldn't bring that up without having a... We're, we're going to close the wormhole now. Sometime in the future, we'll open it back up and go jump in head first, but not right now. Next point, top page five. Publisher, Robert Barker, the King's Printer. Gordon Campbell, author of Bible, the story of the King James Version, 1611 to 2011... Repres uh, presents some interesting history regarding Robert Barker, the publisher of the 1611 King James Bible. He says, quote, The first edition of, King, of the King James Version of the Bible was printed in 1611 by Robert Barker, the King's printer, who held the right to print all Bibles published in England in, published in, England in English translation, work in other languages published in England, and royal books published in Scotland were separate rights. So, we think today in terms of modern copyright. That's not quite what's going on here. Okay? If you wanted to print a book, you had to buy the rights to print it. The king's printer, being that he's the king's printer, is going to be granted for fee the right to print the Bible. All right? So he is printing all English Bibles. Other things, things printed in Scotland, those are sep those would be those rights would be would have been apportioned separately. So at the time, if you wanted to open up Joe Schmo Print Shop, could you print the English Bible without violating Crown authority? The answer is no. You could not. If you wanted to open up Joe Schmo Print Shop and you wanted to print, you know, I don't know. Um, uh, you wanted to print the Bible in Latin or you wanted to print the Bible in German or you wanted to do something in another language, could you do that? You could do that if you had the rights to do so. But anything as far as printing in, in English Bibles in England, that right at the time was granted to the king's printer. All right, next, next sentence. Barker was the son of the, of the queen's printer, Christopher Barker, who had printed large numbers of Bibles as well as official publications such as statutes and proclamations during the reign of Queen Elizabeth. In 1599, Robert succeeded his father as Queen's printer and was subsequently confirmed as King's printer by King James, who succeeded Elizabeth in 1603. He was therefore the inevitable choice for the printing of the King James Version. Late in the century, the university presses of Oxford and Cambridge uh, were to exercise their right to print Bibles, but in 1611, Barker was the sole authorized printer. The printing house of the King's Printer was Northumbrian Land House, a large medieval palace in uh, Eldersgate on the site of the Northumberland Alley, recently vacated by the Earls of Northumberland for a new palace on, on the uh, Strand, the old palace was refurbished as a workshop, and there the first edition of the King James Version was printed. So, it's going to be printed by Robert Barker, the King's Printer. Despite all our study on the primary work in progress documents, we do not know for sure what the translators gave to Robert Barker to execute the first printing. We don't know. Some have speculated that it was a Bod 1602 type document, i.e. a master 1602 bishop's Bible with the recorded changes of the translators noted interlinearly or in the margin. 
Donald L. Brake, author of A Visual History of the King James Bible, identifies some of the possible options. So before we read these options, understand what's going on. All right? Whatever they had as their final, we don't know what they handed to the printer. It could have been a stack of unbound sheets of a 1602 Bishop's Bible with their corrections written in it. Could have been that. It could have been a handwritten thing. It could have been any number of things, but we don't know. It has not survived history. All right. So here are some of the other options that Brake, Dr. Brake is going to mention, starting with the quote. The format of the manuscript copy placed in Robert Barker's hands as a template for the 1611 King James Version remains shrouded in mystery. We don't have it. The first option is that the printer was given a handwritten manuscript of the complete text of the new translation. Wow. Imagine a handwritten text of every single verse from Genesis to Revelation, including the Apocrypha. We can't rule it out, but does that seem that seems mind-boggling to me? Okay, yeah, serious writer's cramp. This possibility is supported by a 1660 pamphlet that circulated in London claiming that certain printers possess a handwritten copy of the Holy Bible in English. If this was the case, if this was the case, if this was the case, the manuscript copy of the King James Version disappeared, possibly destroyed in the Great Fire of 1666. So we just don't know. The London fire raged for several days, sweeping through London, engulfing hundreds of acres of land, destroying thousands of homes, nearly a hundred churches, and most of the business community. When it finally ran its course, little of London remained. So, it is possible that they scripted out by hand every verse, and that that's what they gave to the printer. Can't rule it out as an option. If they did, we don't have it. And it's possible that it was destroyed in the fire of London. Okay? A second possibility is the King James translators delivered a fully annotated version of the Bishop's Bible. Some scholars suggest a strong likelihood that Barker possessed printed pages or preset trays still in stock form from the 1602 Bishop's Bible, which would have been similar to approximately 80 to 90% of the text of the King James Version. In this case, the printer's work would have been easier since he could replace words and phrases in the existing Bishop's Bible typeset with new changes rather than to set entirely new print trays. So that's another option. So imagine, but, but, but if that's true, you have to have a warehouse of, ever, of, of trays and trays and trays and trays of standing type for every page of a 1602 Bishop's Bible. The biggest problem with that idea is this, money. Do you know how much money it would have taken to tie up that much type in keeping standing trays for every page of a 1602 Bishop's Bible? huge expense not saying it couldn't have occurred I'm just saying the amount of money it would have taken because the king the, is the king's printer printing other stuff so is he going is he going to have a ton of type tied up keeping the standing trays around for every page of the bible that he could have been using for other stuff okay so yeah I don't know, that's not necessarily, it doesn't sound like a real great option either. And I don't know if there really was a great option, right? Look at the next paragraph. The translator's original manuscript may have been unusable because it was too messy. This is evidence in a manuscript numbered Bishop's, Bishops Bob 1602, which can be traced back to the translators and is sloppy and difficult to read. An indecipherable manuscript would have made it very difficult for a printer to typeset the manuscript correctly. 
And after the translator's careful attention to detail, the proofreader's work would have been subjective, sometimes to the point of guesswork. I would not want anyone to have to read a handwritten manuscript that I create for anything, much less the entire Bible. All right. Bible scholar David Norton suggests a third alternative, an original, completed manuscript in, in final form may have never existed. If an annotated bishop's Bible, rather than a completion of the translator's work, served as the manuscript provided to the printer, then the first copy that came off the press was the original King James Version printer's copy and served as the template for all subsequent editions i.e. 1613 folios and 1612 uh, Clark's Rose and Octavo. We'll talk about more about that later. Translators Smith and Bilson may have added editorial comments along with chapter headings and page summaries. This theory provides a possible accounting for the variances in the 1612 and 1613 editions um, where both the he and she Bible uh, reading occurs. We'll talk about that also in, six, in, uh, in Ruth 3.15. So there's a text variant in Ruth, Ruth 3.15. Some versions say he went into the city, and other version and other printings say she went into the city. Well, set aside the argument for a minute for which one is right. Is that easy to spot that either somebody accidentally added the S or forgot to add the S? So there's a variant. Okay? Scholars still debate the various theories regarding the method by which the translator's manuscript was passed on to the printers. But no matter the theory or weight of evidence behind it, no manuscript has yet surfaced that represents the translator's fully revised text for the King James Version. Unless history one day reveals new documentation, scholars, historians, and Bible students searching for a clear picture of the printing process for the King James Version will be disappointed. Okay, now, let me just tell you what I think. For me, I think the most plausible explanation is that they gave, that they gave the printer a neater copy of a 1602 bishops with the changes noted. And that what we have in the Bodleian Library in Bod 1602 are extra excess pages that were part of a that were part of the work of the companies at a prior part of the process that is what i think can i prove it no but that's what makes sense to me is what happened so in other words what is bound currently in the bodleian library were excess pages that were left over after they gave the printer the copy they wanted the printer to work off of. That is what I tend to think happened, but I cannot prove it. All right. Any questions about that? Mike? Those working copies, uh, well, the <clears throat> and abbreviations and whatnot, that would have been difficult for the printer to decipher, I think. So I think what happened is they went through all that and they produced a clean one. They had the six. They had the 1602 Bible. The printer in 1604 printed 40 unbound copies of a 1602 bishops. Gave it to all the companies. It's my opinion, and that's all it is—is is an opinion that they noted all of the final changes in a master. 1602 bishops that was done cleanly based upon their final decisions and that's what they gave makes sense. that makes sense to me so then what we have in the British in the Bodleian Library then is work that it, it we already we've we already know this that's not the final work extra work was done but those sheets that were left over somebody scooped those up bound them and put them and gave them to the Bodleian Library at some point. That's what I think happened. I can't prove it though. All right. So for what is arguably the most famous book ever printed in English, there are few records regarding its early publishing history. 
Dr. David Norton discusses this at the beginning of chapter 3 of a textual history of the King James Bible. Quote, the, the printing history of the King James Bible is plagued throughout by inadequate publishing records, presumably because it was considered a revision rather than a new book. The first edition was not entered on the stationer's registers, so we do not know when in 1611 it appeared. We don't know. That's like crazy to me, but we don't know. It is a bit shocking given, every, given everything we have studied about how the King James Bible was made that we cannot know for sure when the 1611 Bible was first published. We know it was in that year. Beyond that, we don't know. All right. In 2020, Kenneth Fincham of the University of Kent wrote an essay for the Journal of Ecclesiastical History titled The King James Bible, Crown, Church, and People, in which he stated the following regarding the publication date of the King James Bible, quote, <clears throat> While too much should not be built on negative evidence, it is striking how the new translation slipped into the public domain without any comment in newsletters or um, ambassadorial reports. No one has been able to establish its actual date of publication, although we can now propose the summer of 1611, since Worcester Cathedral purchased a copy at some point between September and November, while James Usher requested a copy in a letter from 4 October 1611. It seems likely that James I's attention had switched to other more pressing matters First, the Oath of Allegiance campaign from 1607 onwards, with the, kings, uh, with the kings writing two books, orchestrating a team of divines to support his position, and in May 1609, personally laying the foundation stone for Chelsea College, set up in order to rebut Roman error, and secondly, for a year from August 1611, a likely date of the Bible's publication opposing Conrad Vorstis's appointment at uh, Linden. So when Kasuban visited in September 1611, James could talk about nothing else. So it is a weird mystery of history that we don't know exactly when. But can we know on the dated letter of James half to first third of the year, first th third of the year probably, something like that, two thirds of the year that it was printed? By the end of the year, we have some documentation suggesting that it had already been printed. All right. Now, does anybody have any comments or questions? How many of you think it's weird that we got all this information, but we don't know when it was printed? I do. We don't know. We don't know what they gave, what the translators gave to the printer, and we don't know for sure when it first appeared. All right. Now, next Sunday. Uh, what we're going to start looking at, <coughs> what are we going to look at in the next lesson? I'm like three lessons down the road. We're going to start talking about the details related to the first edition from 1611. What's in it? How did it come about? And we'll start looking at some of those things next. All right. Anybody got any questions or comments? It seems like the, <coughs> the very first... Bible off the printer's uh, presses would have been proofread by somebody. I mean, that's the normal procedure. You print one and then. So that's kind of what David Norton is suggesting that they print one and then that one served as like the, the original to edit and adjust, you know, because. One of the things I'm struggling, I've been struggling with big time is to try to figure out, okay, how many printings were there in 1611? What does that mean? So, if the first print run is, say, 20,000 copies, theoretically, should those 20,000 copies, copies be exactly the same? Yes. Yes. Okay. But we have 1611s that have variation between them in certain spots indicating that there were at least how many printings? Two. 
Are you following that? So if I take, if I typeset this page using the old manner, using blocks, you know, block characters, somebody's got to lay that out, proofread it, ink it, press it, right? But whatever mistakes I have, good, bad, right, or wrong, or indifferent, are they all going to be the same on the 20,000 pages of this that I press? Okay, so now if we take another page, and they're almost exactly the same, but there are three differences on this page, then now I know this has to be a different printing from what? From this one. Are you following that? So we don't even know for sure at least two printings were made in 1611. Start sorting all that out next time. Now all that matters for a variety of reasons. Yeah. Um, just for clarification, um, on page three we talked about the example of the three types of printing of the genealogy of um, Esau and uh, the one at the bottom, the King James Dukes. What does Dukes mean? Is that an earned title or is that just a type of nobility or how, how does Dukes work in there? So I, without without looking up Dukes, I have in my mind what I what I know a Duke is, which is a title of nobility. That's what I was thinking. But I would I would surmise just from that that might be they might there might have been a different meaning or or a second meaning of dukes back in 1611 that I'm not aware of right now. And the other question I had about that same passage is that, um, the first two seem to be like the lineage of Esau or the pedigree which would be you know those that preceded him and then the last one the dukes that descended of Esau that would be future generations wouldn't it? Well a, a genealogy of pedigree and descent are, are the same thing. Yeah. So it's all. So they're all talking about the descendants of Esau in different ways. The question is the word dukes. No, the the this, the way I read it, it looks like the first two are talking about his his grandparents or you know people preceding him, but then the, the last one, those that descended of Esau, wouldn't that be his future generation? Okay, now I see what you're saying. Um, yeah, I mean, it's... It seems like there's two different angles to the interpretation. So, yeah, I think you would I mean, have to... It's not a big deal, but I'm just curious about it. Yeah, and we need to be clear here, too. What These three examples on page three are just the... They, they, these are not the biblical text itself. They're the chapter headings that they put in. Oh, okay. It's the same as, like, you know, I got a... Um, this is a Schofield Reference Bible, and I just turned it at random to Job... 38, right? Well, there's a thing here that says part 5 in italics. Editors of the Schofield Reference Bible put that in there. Yeah. That's not inspired text. That's extra stuff that the, pr the publisher, the printer has added to try to help you. Whether it's helpful or not. That's the same thing what we're talking about here on page 3. Yeah. So it would have been a heading up here at the top that said the genealogy of Esau or the dukes that descended from Esau or whatever. So, yeah, specifically, though, um, I think they're largely the same, although I would want to look up a couple of those words and make sure that I'm understanding how they were being used in 1611, particularly the word dukes. Okay? All right, well, with, we're 10 o'clock. Appreciate your attention. Hopefully, even with me forgetting my stuff, it wasn't too bad for you, and uh, we'll, 